All right, so um, my name is Stuart Swadron. Uh, nice to meet you. You guys are the best. There's three courses every year. The first, this is the first one. And you guys invariably are the most prepared and smartest because you're on top of your game. I like how the audiences change as they get towards the actual examination. The third group is, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's raucous. They're unprepared. They're panicked. They haven't set enough of time aside, you know. So you can, you can, you can rest assured that you're the responsible ones. How many people here are uh, doing their, it looks like mostly research. Who, how many people, you look old. What, what, how many people are doing the test for the first time? Okay, those few here, anyone else? That no one on this side? You guys have a, a burden, you have to reassure these folks. You have to tell them it's gonna be okay, and uh, life is gonna go on. And I don't know what you guys can tell these people. You're, you're gonna make money, everything's gonna be okay, you're not gonna get an MTALA violation. Make them feel better because they're just getting into this business. Anyway, um, so nephrology and urology is easily the most interesting topic um, <laughs> because, because you're all really like it. You all wanted to go into internal medicine, but you didn't get in, right? So you had to do emergency medicine residency? Yeah. All right. Well, let me, let me tell you something about, about uh, the, this, is, this section is roughly broken up into two halves. The first half is nephrology, the medicine half, and the second half is the surgical half, the urology half, which I think that for us, being the kind of, you know, here and now baby cow, get it done type people that we are, we tend to be a little bit better at that. So when it comes to the first half, the renal failure half, I have good news for you. How many people here are confused about renal physiology? Electrolytes, renal failure. How many? So there's a couple of honest people, a lot of liars. <laughs> Come on, give me a break, right? Okay, this is the good news. Uh, the folks at uh, ABEM that do the exam, that make that set the exam, they don't have a clue about it either. So what that means is that they're going to stick to fairly classic. They're not going to give you subtle, difficult renal cases. They're going to stick to very classic examples of the main syndromes, and you're going to get the questions all right. And what I've done for you, if you take a look here, I think it's the first 15 or so slides, is a very, um, you know, talk to me like I'm a sixth grader type, break it down in the simplest terms, approach to renal failure. I think it's going to serve you, I think it's going to serve you well for the test. I also think if you're, a lot of people who are involved in teaching, also a good way to teach your residents and to break things down for other people that you're teaching. So everyone knows this diagram here, okay? Pre-renal, renal, renal post-renal. Everyone knows that. Um, and uh, I'm going to highlight different areas in there as we go through uh, and talk about what you need to know at each of those stages. Now, the easiest, easiest one is pre-renal. And the way to remember that is to, and I'm not going to make anyone repeat anything out loud because I know this is a, a serious, studious bunch here. It's not, you don't want hijinks. But just in your mind, say to yourself, uh, pre-renal failure equals shock. Not a person in this room who doesn't know what shock is because, of course, we treat it every shift we ever work. We are seeing patients with shock. Pre-renal failure is just a synonym for shock, full stop. The kidney is not seeing enough volume of blood. And you know the causes of shock, and you know the treatments of shock. I don't need to tell you that. Fluids, 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 and in some cases, pressors relieving obstruction, whatever the cause of shock is. Okay, so that's really, really simple. Um, and, and of course, we're responsible for it. I mean, can you imagine calling up a renal consultant and saying, oh, I've got this patient, the creatinine is three, and then you explaining that the blood pressure is 50, and you know, they're gonna be like, okay, well, maybe you should resuscitate the patient, and then we'll talk, okay, that type of thing. So we're totally responsible for pre-renal failure. It's our job. It, it's not a diagnosis that should ever be made by anybody but us, initially. The, the, the hardest segment is the middle part, the renal failure, okay? And uh, that's the part that really uh, screws people up. That's the intrinsic disease in the kidneys themselves. You can see them outlined. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you from where the blood actually gets into the kidney to the point where the urine exits the kidney, and it's going to go through four steps. And each of those four steps, that something can go wrong. I'm going to identify what the problem is, and we're going to know the classic example of that type of intrinsic renal failure. So let's start with uh, vascular causes. This is often very straightforward on a test. Sometimes it throws us for a loop clinically, actually, and people don't realize what's going on. But let's just say you have a patient who has renal failure. They're not peeing. Their creatinine is high. 
If you see, if there's anything else in that question or in that patient that indicates another organ is failing, so we have a problem with the liver, we have a problem with the brain, like a stroke, we have a heart attack, we have a leg that's cold and pulseless and white, those are all indicating that there's two objects along the big red tube that have malfunctioned, the kidney plus something else. And that's supposed to always make us think of the aorta, and the, the things that go wrong with the aorta, generally speaking, are major things, right? You don't, anything that says aortic on your diagnosis usually is really bad. Um, and so we're totally 100% responsible for that, whether it's a dissection or a AAA or, or embolization that's coming from the, the uh, calcified aortic root. That's what we're supposed to think of. So I think that's kind of a no-brainer um, for us, and we're going to get those. Now it gets a little more complicated because you actually have to go into the kidney, and it's complicated in there, but let me make it very simple. The, see the outline part on the slide there? That's the Bowman's capsule. That's the glomerulus, okay? And that's where the filtering of the blood happens. Now, the one disease that we're supposed to know the best, the one that always comes up on examinations, is the nephritic syndrome, acute nephritic syndrome, which is really a, a synonym for rapid progressive glomerulonephritis, okay? Now, this is the way I think about it. Just, just think of that, uh, the blood is getting filtered through that convoluted uh, structure there, okay, the glomerulus, and what happens is in immune diseases, and the classic one, is post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, okay? And so you're already thinking about that question in your head. It's usually gonna be a kid, they're usually gonna have had a strep infection, they might have had a strep throat, they might have had any type of strep infection in their body. Um, and then a few weeks later, they're gonna start showing symptoms. And what are the symptoms gonna be? What happens is that that glomerulus, if you will, gets all bunged up, all plugged up. It gets plugged up by immune complexes, and by actual clots of blood, cells of uh, red cell cast accumulate there and spill off into the urine, and it doesn't let the fluid out. It doesn't let the fluid be filtered. So what ends up happening is you have a patient who gets fluid overloaded, and they get swollen. And what happens when you have too much fluid coursing through your vessels? You get hypertensive. And of course, since none of that blood is getting filtered, there's no urine. So when you see a patient who's not making urine, they're edematous, and their blood pressure is high, and typically, on exams, they're gonna use that example of the kid with post-strep glomerulonephritis, you've got your diagnosis. The urine is just icing on the cake, and what's the urine gonna have? It's gonna be filled with red cell cast. The treatment is not totally under our domain, but at least we have to recognize this, these patients are gonna get inpatient treatment, usually they're gonna get a consult and steroids. Okay, now, moving from the glomerulus, let's say the fluid has in fact filtered properly through the glomerulus, it then has to get as you know, reabsorbed in the tubules, okay? And that area where it gets reabsorbed is called the interstitium. That's where you have a gradient of, uh, of concentration that ends up uh, making the urine the right dilution for that patient's volume status. And the most important uh, disease that I want you, you to know and the one that will come up most frequently on the examinations is basically like an allergic reaction. It's a, called acute interstitial nephritis. You'll see this with antibiotics very commonly. Penicillin and sulfur are the two most common. It also happens with NSAIDs. And really, the way I want you to remember this one is it's kind of like an allergy. They have uh, low-grade fever sometimes. They have a rash. That sounds very allergic. And eosinophils. They're going to have eosinophils. And they're going to have them in their blood. And they're going to have them in their urine. So it's kind of like an allergic reaction to the drug that's causing a renal allergy, if you will. And of course, the treatment is stop it. I'm going to call a nephrologist, of course. I'm going to say, you know, do I need to use anything else? They might recommend other treatments. They might need to be admitted. They might need to be dialyzed. But important thing is to recognize that diagnosis. So that's not too hard. This is the final, our final stop. We've had four stops in the kidney, and this is our final stop. The last uh, place that the uh, urine filters through is the tubule, the renal tubule. And if you haven't identified a cause up until now by sort of thinking of those first three steps, or first four steps, uh, this is probably where it's going to be. Because acute tubular necrosis is the most common cause of intrinsic renal failure. That's a question that comes up all the time on examinations. It's kind of the garbage bag diagnosis if nothing else seems to be fitting. I, I want to tell you something interesting about this. Uh, there are two types, and you, you've, I, I, everyone in this room has seen this, and I think everyone in this room has probably diagnosed this. There's the kind where they make a lot of pee, and there's the kind where they don't make any pee. Okay, oligurk 
and um, non-oligurg. And it's very simple to know which one is which. Most of the cases of ATN that we see are in two groups of patients. They're in trauma patients. They go into, high, they go into hemorrhagic shock. So they're, they start off as pre-renal failure. And then after time, the kidneys start dying. Okay? And pre-renal failure then turns into uh, acute tubular necrosis. It's ischemia because it's not getting enough perfusion. That happens in trauma. And of course, it also happens the same way in sepsis, right? They go hypovolemic. They're not perfusing their kidney. There's not enough fluid in the system that's going through. It's all third spaced. Um, and again, they go into pre-renal failure followed by intrinsic ATN. So those are the classic things. And we see those. Those are probably 90% of all the cases. And th they're, they're going to be oligemic. There's no urine because there was no blood going into the kidney. There was nothing to make it from. And all the other types of diseases that we learn about, I, I call them the exotic things, the toxicology things, the special drug reactions. You see, I've listed them here, ethylene glycol, multiple myeloma. These are, these are disease states where there's actually damage to the tubules. There's some sort of toxic reaction going on. There's nothing wrong with the amount of blood that's filtering into the, that's coming into the kidneys. Their perfusion's okay. They're not in shock. They don't start off as pre-renal failure, but this poison be it aminoglycoside, uh, be it a toxic alcohol, this poison is actually directly screwing with the tubule, okay? And in that case, th they have renal failure just the same, but the kind where there's enough urine. It's just that the urine doesn't contain the right things, okay? They're not properly filtering their toxins. So if you're making a lot of urine with ATN, it's from one of these toxic mechanisms usually, okay? And that's probably the minority, maybe 5 or 10% of all the cases of ATN. One of the causes of ATN that we will get lots of questions on. It's hard to imagine a, a board exam without questions on rhabdomyolysis. It's hard to imagine. It's one of the types of, one of the causes of ATN that we see more often than others that we're supposed to be experts in. And I wanna say, that's why I wanna say a few more words about it. Now we all know that, eight, that we all know that rhabdo is caused, that the kidney failure that you get in rhabdo, we're specifically talking about the kidney aspects of it, is caused by myoglobin basically plugging up and damaging the tubules. Just at a simple level, that's how I think about it. So you might ask yourself, well, why is it that we don't just measure myoglobin? <laughs> and for those of, you know, most of the people in this room are used to measuring myoglobin for uh, rule out MI protocols, and we all know how useless it is, right? It goes up in every case, you know, a nurse gives a, a shot of uh, morphine and all of a sudden the myoglobin is elevated. We don't know if it's from the heart. It's just not a reliable thing. It's very spurious. And in some cases, the kidneys can be completely plugged up with myoglobin from rhabdo, and because they're all plugged up, there's no, urine, there's no myoglobin in the urine. So the reason why we don't use myoglobin, which is the actual problem, is because it's unreliable. It's unreliable and inconsistent. That's why we use CK. It's not that CK is what kills the kidneys, it's just because CK is reliably elevated in the blood of people who have rhabdo. And CK is released from damaged muscle, as you know. So that's the story behind why we use it. Now, um, the causes of rhabdo are huge, right? You know that it's not just the person who's got muscle damage, typically from, you know, physical trauma. It's also the person with repeat, you know, who's got... Uh, one of my favorite causes uh, was when I was a resident at the county hospital at USC. We had a jail ward that we were in charge of. And you could always tell when one of the new guys were getting initiated because they would come in with painful thighs and they, told that they, they would say that when, when they got into their cell or wherever, the, the, the group that they were in, they were forced to go like this and do squats, right? And that doesn't seem so bad, does it? I can do that, right? No problem. But if, you, if, if I have to continue to do you come back in like five hours, and I'm still doing that, um, what happens is you actually get rhabdo, you get muscle breakdown of your anterior thigh, and they get a compartment syndrome. So we got to be quite expert in treating that com combination of compartment syndrome of the thigh along with rhabdo. So that's another example. Sometimes homeless people that are lying on the street in one place, um, they get, you know, they've got pressure sores. They also can get rhabdo from that. Um, you also are more susceptible to get rhabdo if you're on cocaine or other drugs. I'll never forget a patient I had who, who had it look like just a little simple muscle tear from uh, a, a biceps uh, rupture from, you know, from working out. But he had been using a lot of cocaine and his CK was like 85,000. And so cocaine makes the membranes leaky and really makes you susceptible. And you, you can get rhabdo without even any exercise just by using sympathomimetic drugs, meth and cocaine, tasers, lots and lots of stuff do, uh, does it. So that's, that's all causes of rhabdo. And I want to tell you something else that's very interesting about rhabdo. Um, my creatinine, say, say my creatinine is one, okay? And then you come up to me here and you tie off both my ureters. 
Okay? So, kaput, nothing. It's going to be complete obstruction. Say you come back and measure my creatinine tomorrow. What's it going to be? Maybe one and a half, maybe two. Yeah, exactly right. Um, it's going to go up like that, right? It's going to, it might, maybe the next day it'll be four or five, and you know it's going to take a while to go up. One of the fascinating things about rhabdomyolysis is that their, C, their uh, um, creatinine could go from normal, from 0.9 or 1, and then that afternoon after rhabdo could be at 10. Okay, and that's different than any other type of renal failure, and that's, it, it's a, it's a tip-off that it's rhabdo, and the reason for that, it's very interesting, is because creatinine kinase, CK, is actually metabolized into creatinine. And so the creatinines can go up faster than you would think from just regular dysfunction of the kidneys. So that's another clue for some of the questions. There's a little bit about um, uh, the diagnosis of rhabdo in terms of uh, the fact that you have a dip positive urine, but you see no cells. Okay, that's the hallmark of it. I'm going to go over that in a second once more because there's a differential diagnosis there that I want everyone to understand. I think we talked about everything on this slide except for the treatment, and I think everyone here knows the treatment. It's fluids, fluids, fluids. Um, if, you, if they do ask about bicarb, you can throw that in as well because an alkalinized urine is less likely to precipitate myoglobin and it might uh, be protective. Anything else beyond that is wrong. Okay? There's no other uh, scientific uh, validated treatments for rhabdo other than fluids and perhaps bicarb. And so don't really bite on any of the other things. Uh, it's a matter of research. It's a matter of argument. It's not something for the boards. Okay? So don't, don't get exotic. And then hypocalcemia might need to be treated as well, right? Does that make sense? When you have, whenever you have renal failure, remember the phosphate goes up. When phosphate goes up, calcium goes down. Let's keep it simple. And so you might need to treat hypocalcemia if they're having uh, Shovstek sign or uh, uh, Trousseau sign where they spasm, they'll, they'll need some supplemental calcium. Here is a slide that there's not a, I know there's not a single person in the room who doesn't know all about this because, again, it's the kind of thing you're dealing with every day. Everyone here knows that when a patient is older, when they're diabetic, um, when they're dehydrated, um, these are patients that are really at risk when they get contrast, aren't they? And so this is one of the, and of course, more patients that are older get more studies because they're sicker. And this fact that contrast-induced nephropathy exists is one of the reasons why a lot of us in emergency medicine education are so obsessed with not using contrast when we don't have to. I know the situation. I know that where most of you work, okay, this is really clinically relevant stuff. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's nice to, to ace the boards, but <laughs> this is really clinically relevant. Let's talk about this. So, you know, you don't, you, you're, you're asked to use contrast all the time, and it frustrates you, and it delays things. And the research okay, shows that pretty much we don't need it. There's some exceptions, but aortic dissection might be one exception where contrast really can make the difference of making the diagnosis, but for appendicitis and diverticulitis, it's easier for the radiologist to see it when we use contrast, but the studies have pretty clearly shown that they can make the diagnosis just as well without the contrast. And so the best option, if there's a risk to the kidneys, is not to use it. And I think we use too much of it. And I think probably most of us are in agreement here. We, we feel this. Um, if you are going to use it, you know the things that we need to do to mitigate the risk. We're going we're to use less contrast. We're not going to repeat it with two different studies. We're going to give them a, 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 a liter of fluid before we start. We're going to make sure they're well hydrated. We're going to use special agents with low ionic, low osmolar uh, um, uh, preparations that are less likely to cause it. And there's a lot of controversy about the other things on the slide. The, the, we were using hypertonic saline, and I think that's probably reasonable, but there's more controversy about that in the past few years. It might not be as helpful. So for sure, hydrating them is the key, is the most important thing. Okay, so we've gone to, we've started off with post pre-renal, which is shock, and we've gone through the, the renal causes, and now we're back at something that is, again, very easy, and it's 100% our responsibility. Again, can you imagine calling up a, a, ne a nephrologist and saying, oh, I've got this patient, the creatinine is four, and they're like, well, uh, did you put a Foley in, or do they have urine? Yeah, I mean, this is obviously our responsibility, right? We have to diagnose post-renal failure, and post-renal failure equals obstruction, period, full stop. They're synonyms, okay? Everyone here has seen the prostate patients, and, and, and they know about that. One of the things that sometimes, I think just because we're doing the test quickly, uh, tricks us, uh, into doing the wrong an giving the wrong answer is remember it, re it takes two kidneys to cause post renal obstruction right you have to get both ureters both kidneys you have to get them at the common endpoint at the bladder or the uh, 
or the prostate, you can't just have one ureter. If you tie off one of my ureters, what's my creatinine going to be tomorrow? Totally normal, right?